Okay, so first off, good evening to one third of rough coffee. What's going on, man? How you doing, brother? I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. I feel like I'm in open, bro. <laughs> I feel like you're about to go in on me, bro. Yeah. Spotlights, you know what I mean? Yeah, man. We have, to, we, have to, we, have to, we have to present you guys in the right way, you know. Is it true you're, you know, do they say that you're the founder of rough coffee? It says it on your bio. Yeah, I am. I am the founding member, yes. And I know you probably spoke about a story of how you met all the guys mm -hmm. individually. But I want to stop at that part. So before even Rock Copy existed, um, you you were born in Nigeria. Mm. So if I don't, if I don't, yeah. if I don't, you're getting into that. Ah, see where this is going. You gotta get the Nigerian. Yeah, 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 yeah. Come okay. Come on, put it in the Um, when you were in Nigeria, mm -hmm. growing up, was music part of your ambition? And what was life like for you in Nigeria? Wow. I came out when I was seven. You know, that was a long time ago. Um. What was it like? You know what? Music wasn't music wasn't part of it. I was always a dancer at first. You know what I mean. So I was always part of that energy. Always trying to get my little brother involved and stuff. I was always out, always naked. With, I used to do this thing. What my my little hobby was. You know, you get them tires, the in rim tires, and I used to get the stick. I used to just run down the road with my boxes. But yeah, no, nah, dancing was a big part of my life when I was younger. You know what I mean. The music element only came when I reached England. You know what I mean. So. Nigeria's not an easy country. It's not. It's not. It's not. Um, it's not. Do you have any memories of... Because I, I wasn't born in Nigeria, mm. but I've been to Nigeria and there's always the mentality of you don't work, you don't eat. There's no welfare system. No. You know, you see kids um, hawking from sun up to sun down. Mm. When you were in Abaddon, I mean, what was... Because some people say, oh, they they lived in... They, they were really wealthy back home. Was your situation like that or was it a bit more rougher? I was I was conservative, so I was in the middle. You know what I mean? I wasn't I wasn't rich. I wasn't poor. My my dad always, cause my dad was in Germany at the time, so we always made sure that we was fed. You know what I mean? And my mum's a hard worker anyway, so whatever she needed to do, she did just to look after me and my brother. So. So fast forward, you come to the UK. Mm -hmm. At a time that you would have come to the UK, <laughs> being Nigerian and African wouldn't have been fashionable oh, with an accent. Yeah. It must have been tense at times. I remember the first day. I came, it was in December. I was. It was like a day before Christmas or something, and it was snowing, and I was confused. So I met my dad now, put me at the airport, took me to my auntie's, and then we was in the car. We was in West End, obviously now I know that, but when before I was just like these big buildings. So I'm hanging out the taxi just like this. Hey, how are you? Hey, hey, daddy, daddy. Just absolutely, just fresh, just literally fresh. I was excited. It was excited, it's like a kid in a candy shop. Didn't you know what to expect. But yeah, it was <laughs> it was a good time. It was a good time. The accent was strong, <laughs> very strong. But I was proud of it, so I just ran with it, man. Oh, and even before you even started the interview, you just said that you're you're very proud mm. just to be African. I'm proud, man. Not a lot of Africans born here feel almost a sense of one. I won't say they don't want to feel like the African, but mm. they almost want to be black British here, Westernized, yeah, and then. When they go back, they owe you both. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, um, that situation. How do you feel you fit in now? I think it's Africans in general. I was watching a program the other day. Well, it was actually on Facebook. And Africans have this thing where when they go to a country for maybe, I don't know, they might be on holiday, it might be a business trip, and they might be there for a month or two or maybe six weeks. And then you come back with that same accent. Mm -hmm. You weren't born there. Why do why do we why do we why, why do we feel like we need to conform mm -hmm. to another man's we're African, so let's embrace. If you've got an accent, you've got an accent, embrace it. If you can speak English, why you not mix it in? That, that that'll make you special. Mix it in with a bit of English and then speak mm -hmm. a bit of pigeon. That makes you special rather than always trying to fit in with the mold, you know what I mean? If I go on holiday, yeah, I've been on holiday. I might come back with my might run a bit of a joke on it, like, what's going on, man? You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm not going to try to be that. I'm yeah. not American. I am African. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Who's been brought up in Africa mm -hmm. by way of England. So mm -hmm. I just don't understand. But in general, to be African, I'm proud, obviously, at the moment. We're still in the World Cup, Nigeria. Yeah. Ghanaians are killing it. You know what I mean? Just, I'm just proud of Africa. Even in the music scene, you've got the Whiz Kids, you've got the Malik Berries, you've got the um, Fuse ODGs, you've got the David O's. You know what I mean? You've got Ice Prince, the Bunge, mm -hmm. man like Don Jazzy who set it all off for yeah. all African artists. So it's just, I'm just happy to be African, you know what I mean? And try, trying to bring that Afro, Kangpala music, <laughs> mix of R&B blend. Just trying, just, trying, just, trying, just trying to be different, man. Just trying to be different and authentic. Okay, so now let's, let's, let's move, let's fast forward. Mm. Um, can I only get some of your personality? Yeah. But do you, do you think, I won't say are you, uh, 
I won't say you are uh, you were a victim, mm. but being that you came here so young, you had to adapt. Yeah. So I think you Quick. had to adapt. Quick. Um, and then obviously going into music, what things have you had to adapt to in music? Because now you're a sign artist, mm. you got all eyes on you. What adapting have you had to do? Personally, yeah. in terms of obviously when you when you look at the di dynamics of the group, I'm more the more conservative one. We all got our crazy moments, mm -hmm. but on a general basis, yeah, I might have thrown a, a bit of joke here and there, but I'm the one, like when I enter a situation, I'm already psychoanalyzing that room, you know what I mean? So, in terms of me person personally, um, Mm, how do I put this? I see as a I see you as you're all enigmatic. Because I remember when I first met you, you start off with a joke. Yeah. That's when I first met you. And sometimes you start thinking the person who starts off with a joke, I'm not saying that they're hiding something, mm. but by default when you meet somebody, the person when they have that type of opinion, you realise that there's there's something way more to yeah, the person yeah, yeah. than just the joke. And that's what I took from you. I was like thinking this he, he's funny but I'm sure he's he's, mm. he's very serious. I'm deep, yeah. I'm I mean I'm deep. I mean, what what we what we all realised the other day is we were very open very quickly. And some people might take it as a bit abrasive, some people might it might be too much for some people, the energy level. <laughs> but we read different situations at different times and we adapt. But me personally, I'm I am the quiet one. I mean I just appreciate every situation I'm put in so I can walk into it, even being here right now, like I feel blessed because not many artists or not many Africans can be in this kind of situation mm -hmm. without grafting hard. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying I haven't grafted, I have grafted, we all have. Mm -hmm. But to be in this situation right now, I'm ex it, it excites me. Okay. So, yeah. So, we're going to talk about rough copy. Um, tell us, some, uh, tell us, you know, if you can briefly about, you know, you, you are the founder, mm -hmm. basically the facility of bringing everyone together. So, walk us through you know, that time when you met the guys individually and what made you think of actually mm. making a group? Initially, I actually wanted to be a, like I said, I wanted to go into a whole dance thing. I remember time, there was a group called Peridot, there was Play, there was I Flawless, know, yeah. you know what I mean? That was, that was the people status, that was a kind of hub that the dance scene, they was killing it, that was, that was the family. So I always wanted to be part of that scenario, so I was doing everything from like, going to training in Pineapple, to Huskies when it was still open in Camberwell. So just being around the whole scene, I just loved the whole dance scene at the time. It was it was funky, it was fresh, it was energetic, you know what I mean? So I, I approached a guy called, well, it was my friend, he was my friend at the time, still my friend, called Blaze, he had a management company. And there was a guy called Corey who actually I used to go to school with. And I used to see him just develop year by year. At this time, he was under the management, innit? So he was a great singer, and I used to watch him, but I would see, I'm a dancer, so I'm thinking to myself, I need to, I need to get out of this lifestyle, because I did come from that background of obviously, that road life, you know what I mean? A bit, a bit, a bit mandemish, you know what I mean? So I was trying to just change the pattern of my lifestyle, and I just saw that as a, as an open door to go through. And obviously, him giving me that inspiration, I just thought to myself, one day I just bumped into him on the tram. It was by chance, it wasn't planned. Literally, you saw him, my heart was like, Go on, man, just ask him, innit? Obviously, you can banter with your brethren, but I just took him off the train. He said, yo, listen, I need, I need, I need, I need a way out of this situation, man. I need to be more than what I am right now, and I know I can do it, so give me an opportunity. And he was just like, listen, at the moment, we ain't really doing this dance thing, I'm trying to come out of that dance scene, because the dance scene, people don't really know, but the underground dance scene is worse than the music scene, because everyone is a dog-eat-dog, dog. like, straight in, you walk into a dance room and you see other dancers, you hear this love but you're like, yeah, I want this spot because I mean there's one audition, there's one spot you need to get that to eat. Um, so he was like, yeah, I'm looking for, a, at the moment we're looking for groups because we've got a girl group at the moment, so if you can get another a couple guys together, let's make it happen. Um, so I was like, it was a challenge for me and I was like, wow, okay, I'm used to like, you know what I mean, rolling with Mandem and trying to eat and just trying to do everything just to, you know what I mean, feed ourselves. But I mean, but I was always the, I was always the one in, in within that group who didn't almost fit in because I was a, a bit more, a bit too creative. There was a competition called Credence Got Talent, which I obviously prevailed through and then went on to South Got Talent, which was like obviously the biggest scale of that. And at the, on that same stage, Sterling was singing. And at the same, in the same room, it was him, Derry from The Risk, who I think the people, the world remember mm -hmm. from X Factor, Kelly Rowlands, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, I was just, I was one of them people, I was just up. I was in everyone, because dancers had their room, singers had their room, poets had their room, so I was just everywhere, just 
just being and just being creative and just being busy, flipping everywhere, dancing down the hall. I just heard this. I don't know. It was like a jam session, and out of all their voices, Sterling's voice stood out. And I just walked in there. At this time, he had locks. So I walked in there and I was just like, I'm not shy. So I just walked over. I'm like, yeah, man. I was on the phone with my manager. I was like, yo, hear this, hear this. You know what I mean? I was like, yo, who out of the whole voice, which voice stands out to you? And he pointed out the same voice I, I heard, which was Sterling's. And obviously I was just like, yeah, man, talk to him, talk to him. And he was like, yeah, I was just jamming. I don't know, it just felt like fate. Like I wasn't supposed to be in that room, but I found myself in that room. And obviously I just went to him and said, yo, Sterling, listen, I didn't. Trying to put a comp project together, a little boy group thing. What are you saying? He's like, yeah. <laughs> like he won't blase by it, but it was a bit just like, yeah, yeah. Why not? Let's try it. So the next day, I linked up, showed him to the management, and then he was obviously part of the project. And then a week after, there was a, a showcase in, in um, Crawley where Joe was performing at. But this is the funny thing where he wasn't supposed to be there. He was helping a friend because that person who was actually had that chorus couldn't make it. Mm -hmm. So his friends just hollered him, say, yo, come help me out, man. So, I don't know, I was in the room, and literally the girls just performed, like the girl group just performed, and I was about to get up and go outside with them. Mm -hmm. And literally, as soon as I got up, you know, you turn around for a hot second just to see if you miss anything. Sure. And I literally just saw Joe just going, he came on the stage like, round, round, boom, boom, cat, cat. I was like, who is this you? <laughs> the energy was crazy, so I just thought to myself, nah, I need to, I need to, I need to see more of this you. So I told management, like, yo, that one there, make sure he comes to the audition, him, him. <laughs> and then, yeah, he came and rough, the whole situation was born. There was actually, Pete, the world don't really know this, but there's actually six of us. Six? There was six I of us. Thought, I thought it was four. Yeah. SOS had six members. Okay. The first member wanted to, be, it was actually a dancer as well. So he went, he came in from the dancing. I remember he did his whole audition process and he came in as well. But he stepped back early, said, listen, now I'm gonna produce. I don't think I can do this whole limelight thing. I don't, I don't, I, f I prefer to produce. We're like, okay, cool. Thank you for telling us earlier on. Mm -hmm. And then f there was fifth member, five members then. And then that one was just, his mind weren't right for the, he just wasn't ready. So he let himself go. And then there was four of us, obviously the fourth member, I think three years ago, departed from us, was on his own path mm -hmm. and he's doing great things at the moment. So. That's how SOS slash Rough Copy was born.